I'm Youngjin from Georgia Tech, and today I will talk about the very similar problem of the previous talk, but uh, approaching with a different method to attacking kernel ASRL. And this talk is joint work with my colleague, Dr. Sang Ho Lee, and one of my advisors, Professor Tesu Kim. Uh, let's start with what is kernel ASRL. Maybe uh, you guys are familiar with the kernel ASRL because of the previous talk, but the kernel ASRL is, is just a statistical mitigation for a memory corruption exploits, such as uh, exploiting buffer overflow or use after free. And the mechanism of the kernel ASRL is very simple. It just randomizes the addresses on each boot or it, per each load of the kernel module or drivers. So because it is very simple, so it is very efficient, so the overhead is just less than around 5% of the runtime overhead, so it is applied for most of the uh, commodity op operating systems in these days. Because it randomizes the address of the, all the code and data, for the attacker, if they want to launch code reuse attack, they need to guess the address of the attack, so the success rate of the attacker can drastically downgrade it by the number of the entropies uh, that ASRL can provide. So for example, in Microsoft Windows system, there are uh, around over 8,000 places that kernel addresses can be randomized, so the success rate of the attacker can be uh, degraded by that numbers. Uh, because of the kernel ASRL, in practice, the attacker exploits the another class of the vulnerability but be before of the exploiting the actual memory corruption vulnerability, uh, which is uh, information leak vulnerability, to bypass the kernel as ASRL as a first step. For example, in 2015, there was a privilege escalation attack uh, as happened on the uh, Mac OS X called TPON. And for the successful attack, the attacker exploit three different vulnerabilities for the attack. And uh, of course, the first one is uh, bypassing kernel ASRL using information leak vulnerability. So as seen in the examples, kernel ASRL introduces the additional bar to the attackers. Uh, so without the kernel ASRL, what the attacker need to do is just exploiting the memory corruption vulnerability. But Right now, uh, with the kernel ASRL, it is totally changed like uh, the information leak vulnerability should be there, or they need to guess the address. So the probability of the success rate of the guess or finding information leak vulnerability will be multiplied, so attackers will feel more difficulty on exploit the vulnerability. However, in 2013, in Auckland, Hund et al. presented a very interesting work uh, called uh, Practical Timing Side Channel Attacks Against Kernel ASRL. Uh, one important thing here is they exploited hardware level side channel attack, which means it does not require any kind of software vulnerability or information leak vulnerability to break kernel ASRL. In their attack, they exploited the side channel caused by caching behavior of the translate leukocyte buffer. So for example, if a user level application accesses a kernel address, it will generate page fault because it has uh, insufficient privilege. However, for a mapped address, so TLB will cache the page table entry for the, if it is, even if it is like a failure on the page fault, because of the page fault. So it is caching on the TLB, so page fault will be generated faster than a mapped address. On the other hand, if the address is not mapped, then it must go through the page table work, and then it will finally result with the page fault. So the difference in this, this path be, because of the, the mapping status create a slow and fast path, which differs like around 40 cycles even if the, all the things are fully cached. So using this timing channel, uh, attackers can determine whether the page is uh, mapped or unmapped. So by using such method, Hund et al. resulted that for a specific Intel processor, uh, if a page fault took uh, less than certain threshold, like around 4,050 cycles, then it will be a mapped address. So the figure on the right side actually shows that graph from their research, 
And it seems that there is a tendency of the having less timing on the mapped addresses and having more timing on the uh, mapped one. However, it looks like the channel is quite noisy. So in the middle of the point around the 4050 cycles, we can see lots of the, some of the dots uh, on the gray areas, which, uh, which will be hard to be distinguished as a mapped or a mapped one. Then why this channel suffers the, this kind of noise? So to know about this, uh, let's see the timing break of the attack. So to measure the timing of the page fault, they used the OS exception handler. And to do that, at the user space, they will start the timing, then the control will be moved to the processor, and there will be TLV timing size channel attack, and then page fault will be generated. However, this page fault must go through the exception handler in the operating system, then it will be returned to the user space. So they, can, they need to measure the around the 4,000 cycles, uh, even if the timing size channel is around 40 cycles. And uh, we can see that the, most of the times are spending on the operating system handlers. But on handling exceptions, there are lots, lots of uh, chance that suffers a noise, such as uh, having an interrupt or some other exceptions. Then uh, it will have, uh, Excuse me. Uh, it will take them more time or less time than the actual uh, measurement. So compared to the origin of the timing channel, TLB hit miss is around 40 cycles. However, the noise from the operating system is much more than that, like around uh, more than the 100 cycles. So the noise will cover up the result of the timing the side channel. Then we can ask a research question here. So can we eliminate this noise from the operating system to make the timing channel to be more stable and more accurate? To this end, we present an attack called DRK, which is a borrowed each word from the de-randomizing kernel. Yeah? And it's short. Uh, DRK exploits uh, Intel's new instruction set called Transactional Synchronization Extension, TSX, to eliminate the noise from the operating system. And in the next, let me cover what is Intel TSX first. So Intel TSX uh, is a new instruction set that helps the synchronization of thread in faster way than using traditional locks. Uh, while TSX does not have any kind of blocking locks, its usage is very similar to just using lock and unlock. For example, uh, calling up the X begin, which means the start of the transactional area, uh, creates an atomic region, and the programmers can just write the code right after that uh, function call, then it will create the atomic section. However, the different part with the TSS and the lock is the, in TSX, this atomic region is not guaranteed. It means it just try first, but if there's any kind of data races or some other exceptions, then it will fail. Then finally, it will let the developers, like uh, whether the transaction is failed or not. So, if it has failed, developers can retry the atomic operation with traditional locks to ensure the 100% accuracy or like uh, try the TSX again for the further execution. And at here, we exploit the abort handler of the TSX to uh, reduce the noise for the timing channel attack. So let's move one step further to on the, how the atomic region of TSX can fail and how we can exploit this. So of course, if there's a data races between the threads, it will fail. And also, it will fail on some other exceptions like a timer interrupt or a context switch. And on page fault, it will also fail. And another important point is that, so on failure, rather than uh, notifying the operating system for their exception handler, Intel TSX will directly call the exception handler at the user space, 
which means it does not fall back to the operating system to handling the exception. So TSX will suppress all the exceptions to the operating system and it will directly call the user space function. So the path is uh, more shorter than that. So it will remove the noise from the operating system. Uh, let's take a look at the timing break again. So previously the prior work measured around the 4,000 cycles including operating system exception under. But with TSX, since there is no operating system is involved in the path, the measured timing is around 180 cycles and the timing side channel is around 40 cycles and there merely has the noise. And the code shown on the screen is that how we can measure the timing using TSX, uh, uh, using the page fault timing with TSX. So first, we measure the timing using RDTSCP before getting into TSX region. And inside of the atomic region, we deliberately access some of the kernel address by reading something or by jumping over the address to execute the, on the address. Uh, it will definitely generate page fault because we are working on the user space but accessing on the kernel space. And then the exception handler will be called and we measure the timing between the before of the invoking the TSX region and the invoke of the uh, exception handler. So using such method, we measure the timing for mapped and unmapped addresses for four different uh, processors including desktop, laptop and server machines across uh, three different architectures including Haswell and Broadwell and Skylake. And to catch the effect of the cache correctly, we uh, uh, iteratively run the probing for 1,000 times and the timing result is shown like this. So for the all of the processors, we can see that there is a, there is a timing difference between the mapped and unmapped pages. For the mapped address, it always falls faster than the unmapped one. Likewise, on measuring the executable memories on the kernel, so executable areas always fall faster than the non-executable pages. And not only the timing gap is quite huge, like uh, more than the 20% of the timings uh, for the different uh, page mappings, it also very stable on the result. So here are the timing graph for the mapped and unmapped addresses on the left and executable or non-executable addresses on the right for the full Linux kernel module address spaces. And we can see that the between two clusters, there is a significant timing gap and that there's no dots in the middle. So we can easily draw the line to distinguish the page mappings by the timings. Yeah. And using these primitives that can distinguish mapped and unmapped and executable and non-executable addresses, we evaluate the DRK attack against uh, uh, various operating system which is available on the market. Uh, the operating system includes the Linux and Windows and o Mac OS X because the DRK attack based on the hardware level size channel so it is quite independent to the operating system. And we launched two types of attack for the operating systems. One is try to get a page permission like uh, whether it is uh, executable or non-executable or a mat per each page of the kernel mappings. And uh, type two attack is uh, to get a exact location of the kernel module by exploiting some of the size based signature of the modules. So for the type one attack, we probe each page of the kernel, try to get the, this kind of the mapping from the kernel address space. And it will be very similar to what we can get from the kernel page table mappings from the sys file system. And then we will compare the accuracy of the DRK attack with the ground truth. And for the type two attack, uh, an interesting observation is that on the popular operating systems such as Linux or Windows, uh, a module or a driver 
has a fixed size for their executable or non-executable maps. So for example, in Ubuntu 1604, uh, if a module space mapped like a 4,000 as a hexadecimal as an executable and 4,000 as a non-executable, it will be very likely to be a libAHCI kernel module. And likewise, if the another module size is like a 16,000 for the executable and the non-executable for the 18,000 or something, then it will be the Wi-Fi driver for the Intel CPU. So using this size-based signature, we can exactly identify the where the kernel module is loaded, which will help the attackers to exploiting some vulnerabilities in the kernel module. And for the next, I will show a short video clip that how the DRK works uh, in reality. So in the video, we run the DRK attack. And in the DRK attack, it relies on the like uh, measuring some of the CPU cycles. So it affects a lot on the how the frequency changes on the processor. So one thing we need to do is very easy thing to make the CPU to be a full throttle. So we run a two dummy loop like a just a while one on the background and wait two seconds about that is activated as a full thr throttle, then try to measure the timing. So actually the attack is finished, is less than one second, and let me explain in detail. So first thing DRK is doing is that uh, it first measured uh, what is the threshold for the mappings like a mapped and a mapped address and uh, executable and non-executable addresses. It can be fully done by having the measuring the user level addresses. For example, if we just measuring on the null page with the read access, then it will be definitely a mapped page. Or if we measure uh, like a write access on the some of the read only page, it will be like a fault on the mapped pages. So in this case, oh, excuse me. So in this case, the map address threshold is like a, if the address took less than 183 is mapped address. And if the address took less than 161, then it will be executable address. And next, we will find uh, with this threshold, we will probe the all the space of the kernel to measure the, what is the base and the end address of the kernel and module space. And getting up the base and end address just took 13 milliseconds. And then uh, per each page of the search region, we will measure the permission of the each page, whether it is executable, non-executable, or unmapped. And this attack takes like a less than 100 milliseconds, which is 0.1 seconds. So DRK attack is finished. And the letter is just for the getting the accuracy of the, the comparing the accuracy with the ground truth. And for this uh, execution, we got the 100% accuracy for the page mappings. And we can detect 37 unique modules from the side based signatures. And let's take into the details of the how DRK attack resulted. So the video will open the <coughs> mapping data of the, the result from the DRK. So on the right side, the mapping is shown for the, like a, the mapping is retrieved by the DRK attack. And on the left side, it is the ground truth information. And it is run with the Vim's diff function. So something like a highlighted with the teal color will show the difference. And as you've seen in the screen, there's a no different part on the address or mapping uh, the permission part of the addresses. The only difference is the name of the modules because sometimes we fail to uniquely identify the size. So we just, uh, reduce down the candidates, but for the some of the unique size modules, we can easily locate it at uh, where the base and the end and where the executable or non-executable addresses of the uh, some kernel modules. So we ran this attack on three different popular operating system, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS X. 
and DRK successfully break the kernel ASRL for the all operating systems. And more importantly, Recently, uh, starting from May, uh, Amazon EC2 tried to support the uh, PSX available uh, processor in their X1 in instances, and we launched this DRK attack on the cloud environment, and uh, we can get 100% accuracy to break kernel ASRL in three seconds in the cloud environment. In the next, let's figure out the origin of the timing channel. For the mapped and unmapped addresses, Hund et al. previously conjectured that it is uh, based on the TLB uh, side channel. To verify this, we try to indirectly measure the timing channel by uh, the, the measure the processor by looking at the performance counters while we accessing the mapped and unmapped addresses for one million times. And in the table, we can see that there are lots of TLB misses for unmapped pages and very, very few TLB misses for the mapped pages. So we can easily see that the performance counter shows that DTLB hit miss actually creates the timing size channel. And let's see in a diagram. So for an unmapped address, it will always go to the page table work to get the page, page fault. So it will take a slow path, so it'll take around the 240 cycles, which is slow, yeah. And for the mapped addresses, at the, on the first axis, it will definitely go through the page table uh, to get the page table entry, but on the subsequent axis, it will be TLB hit, then immediately uh, generate the page fault. Uh, therefore, so mapped, page, all, uh, mapped pages are taking a shorter path than the mapped one when it is cached in the TLB. And next is the size channel for executable and non-executable addresses. So maybe, uh, maybe somebody can conjecture that it is based on the ITLB cache hit miss, but we figured out it is not. So the first thing we need to look at is that for the non-executable pages, which took the slower path, uh, as same as a mapped page, actually it hits on the ITLB. So it's quite weird because, uh, because we firstly thought that the ITLB might be the origin of the channel, but it looks like it is not. And the second part we need to focus on is for the executable pages, ITLB even not accessed for that. So definitely ITLB is not the original of the channel. And another clue is that the ITLB, the translation did not even involve for this, uh, the taking fast path pass on the executable pages. So is there any kind of cache that does not require address translations in execution part of the Intel processor? So to figure out the reason, we analyzed several documents uh, in, of the Intel processors on the internet, and we found a patent su uh, submitted by the Intel. And on the execution path, there are two types of the cache. One is the L1 instruction cache, which is uh, virtually indexed physically tagged, with it, which, which requires uh, the TLB uh, involvement on the path. However, on the other hand, there is a micro cache, also known as, known as a decoded I cache, which does not require TLB translation at all because it is virtually indexed and virtually text. So only the virtual addresses are involved in the path. So we conjecture the timing channel as the following. So for the unmapped one, so it is the same, always goes to the page table work, then fault slowly. And for the executable pages, it first goes to the page table work, and then it will cache on the ITLB, and also it will be cached on the decoded iCache, then fault. On the subsequent access, decoded iCache will immediately hit, then it will generate fault for the executable pages. That's why it took the faster path than the other mappings. Then what about the non-executable pages? So in the prior diagrams for mapped and unmapped address, 
if it is cached on the TLV, then it will be on the fast path. But it is not. So, so if the T ITLV hit generates a page fold faster, then it should be the, on the faster timing, but it is not. So we try to analyze the reason behind this. And one thing we can conjecture is that the, uh, because of the cache coherence mechanism of the ITLV, it could be happens. What it means is that, that there is no mechanism to synchronize TLB between the processors. And for example, let's say there is a multi-core processor and the core one sets some of the address as a non-executable, and in the meantime, core two sets the same address as an executable memory. But there's no synchronization mechanism, so core one will still have the false TLB entry, and when core one try to, ex uh, try to execute over the memory, uh, while it is uh, truly the executable one, but it will fail. In such cases, the processor is required to resolve the page table entry to get the correct data, uh, correct permission at the page table. So we conjecture the path for the non-executable as following. So it will access to decoded iCache, miss, and, and hits on the ITLB, but it required to the, goes to the page table work again. Then it will cache it again, then fault. Regardless of the TLB caches, it requires a page fault, so it always go to a uh, slower path. So in summary, for the executable addresses, decoded iCache will, uh, will make the executable addresses to take a fast path, and the, uh, for the other mappings, it always requires a page fault exception under, so it will take a longer path. And next is a discussion about the countermeasures. So at first, because this is a hardware level attack, so we thought about some of the hardware level countermeasures. One thing is the changing the CPU to eliminate the timing channels, but it is very hard to be realized, realized because the, the dynamically patching the hardware is not available. And another thing it could be like uh, turning off the TSX, but uh, it cannot be turned off to like a BIOS menu. It can only be turned off the microcode update. It is quite hard. And also there are some of the legitimate use of the TSX, so it'll be hard to be just turning off. And another uh, the countermeasure could be like using up the coarse grain timer the, to the remove the, reg uh, the reduce the resolution of the RDTSC. But there's a, another way of the work around this like uh, counting I++ and to try to measure the timing indirectly. And the software countermeasure could be like uh, as uh, Gruss et al. Uh, uh, proposed. Uh, separating the kernel page tables from the user page table could be a solution, but for uh, some of the micro benchmark uh, that uses the copy to user, highly, uh, highly used copy to user functions, it suffers like around 30% of the performance overhead due to the TLD flush. And finer grain randomization, more than the page level granularity, would be the great uh, countermeasure for this because the it only can uh, work on the page level granularity, but there will be the compatibility issues on the memory alignments, so it'll be hard to be implemented in practice. And an easy way to defeat this attack is that having some of the fa fake mappings of the kernel, like uh, having some, uh, some uh, mapped, and, uh, mapped addresses on the, even if it is not used, and then the, it will add some of the false positives to the DRK attack, so it will degrade the attack. And in conclusion, uh, DRK attack exploits the exception handling routine of the Intel TSX to remove the noise on the TLV side channel attack. And the DRK attack can distinguish executable and non-executable or mapped pages from the kernel addresses, and the channel is due to the data TLV and decoded iCache. So we think that current kernel ASRL implementation is not this secure. Yeah. And for the final remark, uh, you can try the DRK attack. If your devices are available with TSX, then just clone this uh, Git repository and just wait for a second to uh, get the result of the attack. And thank you for your attention, yeah. and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions.
We have a little bit of time for questions, so man the microphones. We have about three minutes. Uh, Robert Broberg, Cisco Systems. A uh, really fun talk. Yes. Um, the, the fake... Uh, the fake page entries, I don't, uh, wouldn't you be able to discern those with a little bit of work too and then get back to ground truth? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat the question? You mentioned, yeah. you mentioned yeah. a mitigation yes. by referring yeah, fake, uh, yeah, fake, fake pages. Yeah, fake pages, yes. But uh, wouldn't you be able to get around those, I mean, just uh, eventually? Uh, so, so the, it will have some of the, because uh, the mapping that DLK can get will be the, some of the superset of the, the actual ground truth mapping. So it could have some of the false positives, so it could not be the perfect uh, countermeasure for that. But so one example is that uh, in the Linux, if we call some of the function like a Bluetooth uh, socket or something, then it will be lazy loading of the modules uh, will be happen. So if we run DRK attack twice, like a firstly scan the, all the mappings, and after the loading up the module, scan it again, then we can effectively the, locate the, where the Bluetooth module is, then in such cases, it will be uh, hard to the, defeat the DRK attack. So another question? Hi, Sergio from Stanford. Yes. Uh, so I'm wondering, why did Intel not notify the OS? Like, did, what, what is the reason for, for doing this in the first place? Uh, I haven't think about that, but uh, it is highly performance related because uh, it wants to like uh, uh, remove some of the performance overhead of the locks. So I think that that's be that would be the main reason why it just wants to the fail fast. But you can yeah. still abandon the transaction. You can yes. still abandon the TSX transaction yes. and give right. control to the OS. Yeah. So for some of the like uh, exceptions, like uh, asynchronous exceptions such as timer interrupt, then it will uh, fail later than the timing, uh, the, then uh, instead of the directly calling the, the uh, road handler. So there could be some, some of the way that, that the patching the processor to just call the abort handler the later time than the DRK attack okay. could do, be defeated. Do, yeah. do you know if Intel wants to like not do this? In the uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I reported this attack in Intel and Microsoft and US CERT and uh, what I got is that they are working on it, but I don't know what specifically th uh, they are working. Cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. so we've run out of time, so yes. let's move on to the next speaker. Um, let's thank the, the, the speaker first.